hello and uh, welcome i welcome all you to my to this uh, course called bilingualism a cognitive and psycholinguistic perspective so today we start with module 1 part 1 this part is titled becoming and being bilingual now what is bilingual who is a bilingual what is bilingualism what are bilingual societies and so on these are kind of uh, almost understood to be common sense ideas but as we will see this is not such a simple straightforward phenomena this uh, course will deal with various aspects of the same question starting with uh, the society going to the individual bilingual so for that this is the first module which is a kind of a introductory chapter uh, that sets the stage for the later lectures so the first module will have this kind of a road map as you can see setting the stage and uh, where we will talk about language contact and basically how bilingualism comes into place or what does it need uh, in terms of social psychological and other aspects so we will talk about language contact uh, we'll trace the continuum of language contact because uh, one thing we must keep in mind when you talk about language language is a human phenomena and humans are social beings so everything that deals with humans and human uh, behavioral outcome be it language or any other outcome has to take into account the social aspects of it hence we need to look at the entire background entire foundation of the phenomena so we will look at that and when we are talking about the language contacts the society is not stagnant hence the language contact also gives rise to a number of outcomes so there is a continuum which we will look at and what are the possibilities and so on and then of course there are many other aspects to it every all of them will be discussed uh, one by one and then once the set is staged we will go on to the individual the human within whom two languages uh, uh, exist side by side and then we will take up some of the fundamental notions within the individual so that is the uh, road map for this module now to start with the moment i say bilingualism everybody seems to know what it means what it entails it means a person who speaks two languages uh, the very fundamental aspect of bilingualism is precisely that so everybody basically knows who is a bilingual right now many such common notions have this problem of oversimplification when we talk about bilingualism we kind of tend to think that we know but this is like many other notions it is very complex and quite interesting as well i might uh, i would like to add for example take this two sentences sadhana is bilingual and indian metro cities are largely bilingual and sometimes multilingual now nobody will have any problem understanding the meaning of these two sentences in the first sentence we are talking about an individual whose name is sadhana in the, in the second scenario we are talking about a social scenario where an entire city many many indian cities are bilingual what it means is that these two sentences do not mean the same thing how are they different the first sentence talks about individual level bilingualism and the second sentence talks about the societal bilingualism so social bilingualism or societal bilingualism both are uh, used so in this cases uh, sometimes the individual is, is a bilingual sometimes the entire society is bilingual now these two things need not coexist in many societies in many from time immemorial there have been individuals who are bilingual or even multilingual and so on but the societies need not be always bilingual so as a result individual so individual bilingualism and social bilingualism may or may not coexist now the interesting part here is that if a society is bilingual it automatically entails individual bilingualism right so when we say that delhi is a bilingual city typically which would mean that almost everybody in delhi knows two languages they use two languages for most of the purposes from informal to formal and academic administrative and so on these two languages most likely will be hindi and english so that is what it means in a scenario like this most people who live in delhi will be proficient to some degree or the other bilingual so social bilingualism entails individual bilingualism but the opposite is not always true so individuals may be bilingual but there are possibilities of them functioning within a largely monolingual society imagine a person uh, imagine a bilingual person traveling to a remote village in um, any of the indian states let's say to kerala 
So, we can go I as a bilingual can travel uh, to Kerala in a remote village where everybody knows only Malayalam right. So, that is possible. However, when individual and social bilingualism coexist take the example of Delhi for example. So, in that case also it is quite possible that the linguistic landscape of the person and the society may not overlap. So, let us say Sadhana is a person from Kerala. Okay, so she has been living in Delhi for a long time as a result of which she speaks Malayalam and Hindi. So, she is a Malayalam Hindi bilingual speaker. Now, the landscape of Delhi as I just mentioned uh, most common linguistic landscape will be Hindi English bilingualism. So, there can be changes, there can be differences, there can be overlaps at some places, no overlap at other places and so on. There are all kinds of um, possibilities. So, there are as you can see it is a very nuanced uh, thing when you talk about bilingualism either in social term or in individual term it is quite nuanced and we are beginning to just peel the onion. Another aspect of bilingualism is often we think that bilingual is a recent phenomena. It is a new thing globalization, urbanization, you know global village and so on because of all these we have bilingualism because of all these a lot of people speak two languages now. It is true of course, it is true, but it is not entirely true. Just pause for a moment and think people have there have been uh, movement of people from one place to another for various purposes. Let us start with the kings, the ancient kings who ruled over a vast tract of land conquering ever new territories for their own uh, kingdom to get bigger and bigger. How did they manage without bilinguals? You need people to govern the new newly acquired states, you need people to do your tax collection, all the fundamental machinery of the kingdom has to run and that depends on people with language skills, right. So, bilingualism must have been prevalent at that time. Similarly, for war, for spying into, uh, uh, into your enemy zone, and all other such things that are part of expansion of kingdom needs bilingual people. So, there must have been a class of people, a group of people who were bilinguals. Similarly, trades across countries, across territories have been, we all know about the Silk Route, there are many other such uh, uh, famous routes. People traveling from one region to another for trade purposes they must have been bilingual at least a sizable population among them must have been bilingual in order to be successful in their trade right. So, all of these things existed, but the problem is we do not really have an academic discourse on this from that time. What we have is some texts from the ancient times and that is what we have to go by for the time being. So, bilingual speech communities through history it's the oldest record that we have of bilingualism existing in the ancient world comes from the Roman Empire. In the Roman Empire, it was quite common the elites within the Roman Empire knew Greek as a second language because Greek language as you all know was the epitome of uh, knowledge, epitome of philosophy, science and so on. So, knowing Greek was a hallmark of being among the learned uh, class. So, as a result of which many scholars refer to this Greek Latin bilingualism as an elite bilingualism because this was almost uh, entirely restricted to the elite class. So, the upper class uh, Romans who were fluent in English because Greek philosophy and Greek language and science and so on. And then there are some examples that we have now, the some examples like um, uh, Aeneas for example, he was a celebrated poet and author who was proficient in three languages Greek, Latin and Oscar. Similarly, a famous king is also known to have known 25 languages. Cicero as uh, many of you would be aware of, a very prominent Greek philosopher, he was also a Greek, Latin bilingual. In fact, he took his bilingualism so seriously, he took his uh, Greek language knowledge so seriously, knowledge of Greek language and philosophy and other things that there are texts where uh, he attacks a philosopher various for his lack of knowledge in Greek. So, that was how important knowledge of Greek among the uh, Roman elite was. Now, we are only beginning to know about the bilingual practices during the ancient time because we do not have any written text as a, as a discourse, as an academic uh, uh, writing. What we have is this text. So, going by those texts, we know what probably would, would be the nature of bilingualism in those times. For example, in case of Cicero, some very interesting observations have been made by some scholars. This is primarily based on his letters and some of his writings. So, um, some of his letters contain code switching, 
code switching when he was writing to either the Roman senator Atticus, Atticus was his friend and, and he was a Roman senator and when he was writing to his brother Quintus. But the letters written to women did not have the code switching. Hence, some researchers have pointed out that bilingualism was probably practiced as a political, you know, having some political angle to it. In personal communications, people probably did not uh, use code switched language, probably to, you know, to be, to, to appear uh, different. However, his, all his communication with all politicians also did not have code switching. For example, his communication with uh, Brutus, all of you know about Brutus, he was among the most well known of the assassins of uh, Julius Caesar. So, when his writings to, uh, to uh, Brutus also did not contain um, uh, the technical terms in Greek. So, this is not only a political, sociological and uh, this not only points to a political and sociological aspect of bilingualism, but also perhaps to a psychological angle to it. Because both Brutus and uh, Atticus and others were all part belonging to the same social class that is the ruling class, they are all senators. So, while he was using code switch version with one another with another person he did not. So, that talks about that really that tells us something. In any case, similar bilingualism was also found in Egypt during the Roman rule, Latin Gothic interaction also was uh, there and so on. So, there are some such uh, references that we have uh, as of today. Now, most of these references are from classics as I mentioned that these are from the writings. So, the texts written uh, and left by these uh, great authors and that is what we have letters and books and you know uh, other texts, uh, poems and so on that we have. The, and that is all we have to go by. The reason why uh, we do not have any um, written discourse on the nature of language use, what uh, language was used by which group of people and so on probably is because there was no official language policy which we have now. Every country has its own language official language policy. So, in India for example, we follow a multilingual language policy. In the US there is a monolingual language policy. Probably in the ancient world there was no stated policy and as a result people could uh, you know use languages as per their own uh, choice and hence it did not make uh, an important case to be studied. Probably this is just what the researchers are uh, thinking at this point. So, anyway, so this short uh, description of uh, bilingualism in the ancient world tells us one thing for sure that bilingualism has been around for a very long time, for a much longer time than studies on bilingualism have existed for example. So, this is as old as that and secondly it is a complex phenomenon, complex phenomenon because it has various levels of psychological, social, cognitive and neural aspects which we will discuss in, in, in the due course of this uh, in the next modules. So, I can think of a ready metaphor like an ant hill, uh, many of you might have uh, seen an ant hill. Ant hills uh, look very uh, simplistic from outside, it is just a mound, it is just a small uh, soil mound, but uh, of course, sometimes they are very they are designer as well. So, but uh, inside an ant, ant hill there are multiple layers all interconnected quite a complex structure. So, we can think of bilingualism in, in, uh, in terms of an ant hill uh, as well. So, there are different levels of interaction and it is a very complex range of phenomena, it is not just one thing, it is not just as I just gave you an example of Cicero for example uh, in, the, in the previous uh, slide. The Cicero was using bilingual uh, language switching with some senators and not with another other senators, but he was not using any code switching with in his in his personal communications, in his informal communications. So, there are all these different ranges of phenomenon within the larger umbrella term called bilingualism. So, they have, there are different levels of interactions and interpretations. So, this kind of sets the tone of the course. Basically, what we are trying to say here is that uh, through time the way bilingualism as a phenomena has been seen has all has changed. So, in the initial stages there have been studies on bilingual language development, how uh, we learn two languages, what are the mechanisms that children or adults uh, put in place and so on and then there have been bilingual behavior, uh, things change as academic uh, atmosphere changes in the world. So, 1950s there was a cognitive revolution as a result of which bilingualism and bilingual studies also got into got some new perspective. So, um, cognitive science perspective was brought into the bilingualism research followed by the constructionist approaches to grammar by in the 1980s. 
and then followed by uh, neuroscience of bilingualism etc. Neuroscience also took giant leaps uh, in the 60s and 70s and now we know a lot about the interaction between the brain structure and uh, bilingual language processing. So, these are some of the broad strokes of research uh, uh, agenda. So, basically it is it is been a short uh, journey from structural analysis uh, short because bilingualism research as such is not very old. But within this period we have had a journey from structural analysis to understanding of the bilingual mind. This is where we are today, we are trying to understand the bilingual mind. Is it uh, any different with uh, from monolinguals or uh, are bilinguals different, bilinguals themselves different, different uh, types of bilingualism exist, different types of social structure exists. So, uh, what are the interactions of, the, of these uh, background mechanisms with the bilingual mind? These are some of the questions that are being addressed today. So, with uh, all of these changes in the research of course, could not have happened without changes in the available tools and changing methodologies of research. And uh, another important aspect of course, is this is the in, uh, very increasingly interdisciplinary nature of research. Today uh, many fields uh, are seeing this change, this is uh, research has become primarily interdisciplinary because you cannot uh, and certainly for a case like languages uh, whether it is bilingualism or any other aspect of language, one needs to look at the social background, background social um, structure, similarly the social cognition aspect and of course, the, the psychological and other uh, arenas of the individual person. So, this needs to bring together various uh, domains of uh, specialists and that is what we see in a bilingualism research as well. So, with this kind of a background, let us now move on to taking care of our fundamentals of this uh, course. So, fundamentals, let us start with the very word bilingualism itself, bilingualism as in two languages and plus whatever that entails, that ism is whatever that entails, actually it entails a lot. So, two languages for this for bilingualism to exist in a person or in a society, you need two languages meaning two groups of people speaking to different languages to come together, it is quite simplistic uh, to talk about. However, there are this uh, few questions that one can ask when languages meet, when, when languages come in contact, when people come in contact, are those meet, how do these meetings happen, what are the reasons, what are the motivations, that is one thing that one needs to look at. Then are these meetings simple or are they complex in nature? There is no such thing as uh, you know, languages meeting, there are layers of interaction, there are layers of complexities in each of these interactions, hence it is very difficult to answer whether it is a simple straightforward thing or a complex thing, we need to take case by case. As a result of which we have another question, do they bring same kind of results, do we have similar results for different kinds of interactions? The answer to this, the short answer to this is no and the long answer is what this entire uh, module 1 is about. So, let us start Jab languages met as in when languages met, languages have met ever since as we talked about in the very beginning, people have always moved. Why do people move? People moved for food, in the initial stages people moved for in search of food, in search of better weather and so on. Later on when societies emerged, people moved for you know conquering territories, then the, as a result war conquest colonization and then we have migration of various types whether it is uh, forced or it is uh, self-imposed migration and then we have intermarriage and trade of course has been a prime motivator for movement of people speaking different languages to different people. Now these kinds of different kinds of motivation for movement have very different kinds of outcome in terms of language contact. So what happens when two different uh, groups meet in war for example, so one group loses out another group becomes victorious as a result the, the result of um, in terms of language is also very different which is may, which may or may not be similar to the trade scenario. So different scenarios uh, have different outcomes, we will look at each of them separately now. So, depending on what kind of contact we have, we can actually have four different types of, of contact. The first is what let us call them socially separate. 
socially separate as in the two groups coming together do not really mingle, they come together for certain purposes, but they do not really mingle. So, society keeps them separate, the rules and regulations and so on are so strict that they cannot come together. Now, this contact is typically very strictly for the purpose for which they have come together as a result of which there is no exchange of language and culture between the groups or among the groups let us say. This is one. You might think uh, in today's time it sounds a little implausible, but there was a time when this was quite common. This was quite common in cases of slavery and uh, plantation, uh, the workers, plantation workers and their masters and so on. Secondly, you have a more commonly uh, found scenario which is called social contact. Social contact is when communities have lived side by side for a very long time. Now, this leads to a very different dynamics. For example, in, in India, for example, India, the, the country, the country is a political entity, but then but the, the entire uh, geographical uh, stretch has been around and people have been here for as long as we know. And their people are different, people have been speaking different languages with different cultures uh, and so on. So, this kind of, however, people from different regions uh, have always moved between uh, different states and for trade and other purposes um, as a result of which communities have come together. In fact, another reason uh, which textbooks typically do not uh, add, but I think in Indian scenario we might as well take it as another important motivation which is pilgrimage. So, all of us know about Adi Sankaracharya who travelled on foot from Kerala to Kashmir. So, it was not uh, very uncommon and it was not unheard of at that time, people used to take long uh, journeys from one part to a part of the country to another for pilgrimage. Today it happens as well, but things have changed to a large extent. So, these are certain things. So, social contact can be like this, people coming together whether living side by side or moving one from one place to another as a or within the society where they can mingle normally and naturally. So, there is a lot of possibility of lot of exchanges that is what is important here. Now, this exchange creates very interesting outcomes as we will see. Third, which is called the marketplace contact, uh, this is uh, also called the trade related contact. Trade related contacts typically as the name suggests brings people together for trade purposes. So, traders going from one place to another or uh, different types of different uh, groups of people coming together at one place in the in the so called marketplace. So, uh, people speaking different languages coming at the at one place and carrying out their uh, activities. These are all trade related purposes. Now, trade purposes also give rise to interesting results uh, and, uh, which we will also see here. In some cases, uh, we have uh, a trade scenario sometimes gives rise to unusual uh, outcomes, but sometimes also bilingualism. Last but not the least is the family level. Family level contact, um, this is more visible today uh, compared to what it was yes before in the yester years. So, moving into a new family, there was convention which was kind of prevalent in many communities across the world, whether it is uh, you know and the our in uh, whether it is in the Asian uh, continent or the other other European and other continents. This has been quite common that women are married outside the community. So, smaller groups had this practice quite often. So, women are married into a different community, different uh, tribal uh, group or so on as a result of which the woman is coming into a family which speaks a different language and now she is expected to learn their language and pass it on to the next generation. Similarly, there are uh, during the slavery and other during the, those, those times, uh, slaves were into the coming into the family, they also had a different kind of contact scenario. So, this sometimes also creates very unusual outcomes. Now, let us look at them separately. So, most well known cases of you know, socially separate uh, contact between communities is that has been well documented and studied is that of plantation communities and slave trade. Plantation as you all might be aware of uh, during the colonial period, plantations were uh, where the European powers were, were having plantations uh, where they had workers from typically from many African um, groups and uh, from other places as well, uh, even India for example. So, these plantations typically will have workers from diverse backgrounds, they will work there and the master will typically be a um, European uh, white man. Now, this was a situation which is very strictly stratified, very, very strictly there was social separation at under no circumstances where the slaves may uh, allowed to uh, get too close to the master. 
this had very um, strange outcome the, because there was no social uh, give and take, there was no exchange. The slaves could not learn the master's language or the culture, anything for that matter in a proper way. However, they had to uh, follow orders. So, they had to learn bits and pieces of the master's language. Often this gave rise to what we call pidgin, pidgin languages that came out of this kind of a scenario. Um, pidgins are also sometimes have been resulted out of normal trade scenario, but uh, because primarily it has been associated with slave trade, hence we tend to consider pidgin as an outcome of slave trade. This is uh, this, that was one. Secondly, social contact as I was mentioning. So, social contact of languages and communities is a lot more um, positive, it, it, it positive in the sense it, it has a positive attitude. So, people can come together, they can exchange uh, their ideas, there is a cultural and linguistic exchange as a result of which bilingualism is a probable outcome, right. So, there are many kinds of, there are many shades of changes that can happen. One is of course bilingualism, so of people learning another person's language and uh, learning about their culture and so on, that is one. Another is this kind of contact also brings in changes to your own language, the including the sound system. So, for example, in India we have five language families, so Indo-Aryan, Dravidian, Tibetan-Burman and Austroasiatic. Uh, so, these people have been in touch forever as, as far back as we know of, as a result of which there is something called a linguistic area that comes into uh, place. So, India is also called uh, language area, linguistic area or Sprachbund, boon for example. So, what happens in such a scenario is that when people speaking different languages often belonging to different language families, genetically different families, the languages all of these languages start imbibing some properties from the other languages. As a result of which there will always be a list of features that are part of all the language families. For example, in Indian, in case of Indian linguistic area, Indian Sprachbund, what we have, there is a list of things. One of them is of course, any linguistic students will know the sound T, the retroflex, strong retroflex is found in, uh, in almost all the languages except Tibetan Burman. So, in the Northeast India, you will not find, in, in some cases, you will, in some languages, you will not find the T sound, but otherwise all other Indian languages do have. Similarly, the explicator compound verb this is also a structure that almost all Indian languages have. Now, it is it is been uh, so long in the in chronological terms, the, we do not know for how long these languages have lived side by side. Uh, so, it is very difficult to trace back where these features came from. They probably maybe feature 1 came from one language, feature 2 from another language, but now it is uh, such that the scenario is such that all these languages share the same set of features. So, this is what is called a linguistic area. This is a very common outcome of um, a scenario where languages have lived side by side for a very long time and where common give and take social fluidity is there and there is a lot of cultural exchange and uh, that is when we see this kind of uh, possibilities existing. And of course, we have our marketplace contact like as I, as I said, pidgin is a very common outcome, very uh, widely known outcome of a trade scenario. Sometimes it is part of the plantation or the slave trade. Uh, but sometimes normal trade situ situations also give rise to pigeon. So, there is this uh, language called uh, Sadri in the central part of India. Uh, Sadri is uh, spoken uh, widely in Jharkhand. Now, this started as a lingua franca, uh, many consider it as a uh, pigeon, it started as a pigeon. Uh, we do not know when, but pretty much pretty old, this is like this language also is old. Uh, so, this is this resulted out of a trade situation between the speakers of different um, indigenous language speakers as well as the speakers of Hindi and other languages. So, you have Sadri has properties of many indigenous languages, local tribal languages as well as a Hindi, strong Hindi presence. So, that is how it, this language came into being. Similarly, in the Northeast India, we have Nagamese. So, it is the Assamese language with some Naga uh, in inputs. This came out in, in the context of trade scenario between the Assamese and the Naga uh, traders. So, this kind of uh, scenario can happen, this is these are the most common outcomes of a uh, trade, trade situation, but however, there are some other possibilities as well. Sometimes we have mixed language which is a different category of language altogether, sometimes bilingualism is also one of the outcomes. And family level as we have uh, seen, 
that um, many kinds of uh, intermarriage between different communities. So, marrying across communities have given rise to very interesting outcomes, uh, sometimes uh, quite interesting outcomes which is uh, uh, not always uh, very well known. So, marriage of settlers with uh, various native women is also a very interesting case in this uh, scenario. So, basically the reason why all these different kinds of uh, social contacts um, are discussed here is to show just to show that uh, people coming in contact, languages coming in contact is not a simple phenomena. Languages come in contact for due to various different kinds of motivation and depending on the motivation, depending on the nature of contact the outcome changes. So, first we will see some of the unusual, let us say uh, unusual or uncommon, less common uh, outcomes and then we will go to our primary concern which is bilingualism. So, unusual outcomes are the creation of pidgins and creoles and also what we call mixed or dual source language. So, that is something we will discuss first and then uh, we will go on to bilingualism which is more often than not a very typical outcome of languages coming into contact given certain conditions are met. Right. So, we will go to pidgin creole and dual source language. So, a pidgin is a system of communication, it is a kind of a language that is used by people who do not know each other's language. However, they need to communicate, the need to communicate arises out of a trade scenario. So, the purpose of creating a pidgin is that immediate purpose of the trade, immediate purpose of whatever they are here for whatever has brought them together. So, that is the primary thing. This is primarily created as I said in plantations and other places. How is this created? How, is, how does this language come into being? These languages are de typically derived from different sources. The primary source being the master's language, master's language as in the typically the uh, the, the, the plantation owner, the slave owner's language because they are, the, the orders are given in their language. Not, not in the African uh, slaves language. So, the primary source for a pidgin is always the, uh, the dominant communities language which is also called the lexifier source language that is the, te that is the technical term for this. Lexifier source language basically means that the primary lexicon of a pidgin comes from the master's language. So, basically most of the words or let us say almost all the words so, when the pidgin starts are derived from the master's language. So, this is spoken non-natively, non-natively as in nobody is a native speaker of a pidgin. Everyone whoever is using a pidgin is using it for a particular specific purpose, not for normal day to day uh, communication. This is not a language that people use when they sit down for a cup of tea for example. It is only for a particular scenario to be used only with particular participants in a conversation right. So, it is uh, always there is always this in group out group uh, kind of a scenario. So, this is used for the other group. Another important aspect of pidgin is that it had to be very simple. Remember we said that in the in a plantation scenario where there is a ma slave master and there are a group of slaves. So, the onus of understanding the master's order is on the slaves. The master has absolutely no obligation to learn anybody else's language, but the slaves for their own uh, survival and uh, uh, for their own benefit should must learn the master's language and that is what basically motivates this kind of a scenario. And because of this very specific uh, nature of the uh, use of this language, the vocabulary is also typically very very restricted restricted because that this language is to be used only for a per that kind of a purpose. So, let us say a pigeon arising out of a sugar plantation or a cotton plantation typically will have words that are necessary for carrying out the business of the work. So, uh, collecting the cotton and you know, packing them, cleaning them and so on and so forth. So, the language will have words uh, the lexicon for this kind of purposes. It will most probably not have any word for uh, things like creativity or art or you know history or music and so on. This is what we mean that a very specific sort of lexicon is typically created in a pigeon. So, this is um, another important thing about pigeons in the African uh, in the slave trade in the African plantations is that the typical scenario in a plantation was that groups of small very small groups of slaves were created 
uh, they were they were uh, taken from different linguistic backgrounds. So, let us say there will be Swahili speakers, there will be Zulu speakers, there will be other speakers and so on. They never had the, the masters took great care not to have a large group uh, of people from any specific community. This was done to minimize the chances of a revolt. So, these people who were derived, who were drawn from different groups also had to communicate among themselves. So, that was another another important aspect of pigeons. So, uh, the grammatical features of a pigeon are like this, lexicon is always derived from the dominant language. So, there are English based pigeons, French based pigeon, Dutch based pigeon, basically the languages that the colonizers of the time. So, the, um, the and then phonology and syntax derived from the dominated language. So, you take the words from English and use your own languages rules in terms of how to create the sentence, how they will be pronounced that will depend on the speaker's own language. So, this is the kind of a mix up that happens and uh, typically grammar books will tell you that pigeons do not have any morphology. What it basically means is that there is no complex word formation process. So, there is no inflection, there is no derivation and stuff. It is just words put one after another and created and sentences are created like that and also severe structural simplification. When you do not have morphology, when you do not have complex grammar, it will be anyway simple. So, this is an example that I have taken from a rather famous comic strip in Papua New Guinea. So, Papua New Guinea is a tiny country which has a large number of languages and this was asked while there were lots of uh, colonies here, there's lots of uh, uh, plantation uh, were there with different kinds of people. So, this it was it is uh, this is called tok pisin, tok comes from tok and pisin from pigeon. So, this is this is the what the language is called you know uh, talking in pigeon for example. And over a period of time the language has gone through changes, um, language as the language is an organic thing, it cannot stay stagnant whatever is the structure today tomorrow there will be a different uh, way of looking at it. As we all know if you have noticed youngsters talking how different words which, which initially starts with as meaningless, meaningless to our ears probably, but for young generation they, per, they are perfectly meaningful and over a period of time those words become accepted words in the mainstream language. Similarly, it is so basically languages change over a period of time and that is true for pigeons as well. In any case, so this is how it uh, reads, suppose you tie plenty uh, peanut, by you become up strong all same phantom. So, fan, uh, basically meaning if you eat plenty of peanuts, you will come up strong like the phantom. So, you see the simplicity of this sentence and the way they are written, and this, this is how they are written also. So, this is a person who is talking about phantom. So, how to be as strong as the phantom, the, the character mm, phantom. Again, so they are saying that uh, phantom you pray true belong me. Now, you see the sentence you uh, pray true belong me, you are a true friend of mine. Belong me is a structure that the local languages allow. So, my friend does not exist in those languages. It has to be friend belonging me to me or the book belonging to me, the house belonging to me that kind of a structure. So, this is what we mean when we say that the sentence structure is derived from the dominated language, but as you can see the words are all from the dominant English language. So, this is an example of a uh, pigeon. Now, pigeon might sound so the when you see this sentence it sounds like a very strange you sort of identify it as English because the words are English. So, you might think this is a bad English, this is an example of bad English. So, that uh, so as a result there are many many such misconceptions about pigeon. So, you can just check here. So, pigeons are not an example of a bad X lang bad X bad language, bad, bad English, bad Dutch, bad French or whatever. This is itself a language, this is created for a specific purpose which has a specific community of speakers and it is never meant to master the L2, L2 as in second language. So, people who started to use a pigeon in the plantations, the final goal was never to be a proficient speaker of English, final goal was only to be able to understand the master and to make themselves understandable to the master, that is it, there was no other goal. Similarly, this is also not a case of borrowing. Why it is not a borrowing? Because borrowing in linguistics basically means borrowing into something. So, Hindi language has lots of English words borrowed into it. So, tea, uh, table, chair, all, all these are borrowed words, they are not English words. But today we do not say piala or you know kursi, 
we would rather say chair and table. So, these are borrowed words into English, but to be borrowed into something there should be an already existing structure, pigeons are do not have that kind of a uh, luxury. This is just a uh, case of you know taking the words and putting some simple rules and creating a new variety altogether and so on. And another important aspect of pidgin is that it has no native speakers. All the people using the pidgin have their own languages for all other purposes. Pidgins are of course uh, a lingua franca. What is a lingua franca? Lingua franca is when a language is uh, used for communication across groups. So, this is a more of a usage based terminology. So, I say English is the lingua franca in the academic higher education uh, systems in, in acad higher uh, education in academia, in judiciary, in administration and so on. So, English is the language that is used by everybody for those purposes. Pigeons are also lingua franca because pigeons are also used for this particular purpose of you know talking across communities. As a result, pigeons are always lingua franca, but all frang lingua francas are not pigeon. That uh, difference is important. Now, when we are at, at pigeon, we should also talk about creole. Creole is the next stage of a pigeon. So, pigeons when they acquire native speakers, how pigeons acquire native speakers? Imagine a situation in a plantation where the both the parents are workers in the plantation. They speak a particular pigeon or during the work hours over a period of time when they come back home they start using the, that language at home as well. Children growing up in that kind of an atmosphere acquires the pidgin as their mother tongue. So, in linguistics technically a language will be called a creole if it has native speakers. However, pidgins also will have after over a period of time it will acquire newer rules and more complexity. So, sometimes structurally pidgins and creoles may not have many differences, but the only difference crucial difference being is the existence of native speaker. So, creoles are like more like natural languages. Uh, by the time a pigeon becomes a creole, it takes some time, right? So, in as a result of which it has already imbibed a lot of complex grammatical aspects like tense, article, other morphology, other different kinds of morphology embedding, and so on. Uh, this could also happen in an advanced stage of pigeon. Basically, what this means is that the simplification of a pigeon is repaired by in a creole. As I just said before as well that languages keep moving, languages keep changing. So, creoles pigeons to creoles and creoles also has certain other possibilities. Depending on the social scenario where the creole is spoken, a creole can take different kinds of turns. One scenario is let us say when the creole is spoken at a place where the master's language is also present and the social scenario has changed. Let us say, say slavery has been abolished, the masters have stayed back. So, English is spoken in the uh, same geographical location where the creole is spoken. Quite often as th this kind of a scenario gives rise to what process called decreolization. So, gradually over a period of time the creole variety gets repaired further and further and it starts to approximate the lexifier source language. So, this takes some time, but uh, this goes through various stages as you can see starting with basilic that is the uh, first uh, part of the creole that is when the creole was uh, it was a creole and then through various uh, stages of post creole continuum which are called mesolex and finally it becomes closer to the lexifier source language uh, that is called acrolect that um, when that has been uh, achieved it is called an acrolect. So, this is how pigeons uh, can uh, go on to become creole and creoles can ultimately become an approximation of the L2. However, if the master's language, if the lexifier source language is not present there, then this, this possibility does not exist. What happens if the masters have left? That is what happened in Papua New Guinea. So, the masters left, people were left speaking uh, Tokpisin as a language and they gradually the language became slightly more complex with more grammatical rules, with more complexities and so on and so forth. And the language that is that remains a creole, it does not become English, it does not become a variety of English. And uh, it, in Papua New Guinea's case is very interesting because Tokpisin is also their official language. In any case, uh, there is yet another interesting possibility called creoloid. Creoloid, the name sort of a slightly uh, misleading. Creoloid has nothing to do with creole. It is a language where uh, they, though there are some amount of mixture, but they are not uh, basically creoles because this does not come from uh, pigeons. Most well known case of creoloid is Afrikaans. Afrikaans is basically a variety of Dutch that is spoken in South Africa because it is 
spoken in Africa probably that is how the name came into being. So, this language is kind of a variety of Dutch, it is mutually understandable, mutually intelligible with Dutch, but it also has a lot of mixture from other languages like Malay and Portuguese and so on. This is uh, spoken by non natively by speakers of these languages and this was also used for, uh, in various kinds of social functions. Yet another interesting outcome of languages and people coming into contact is uh, mixed languages which is probably one of the least visible ones, uh, these, are, these are not very common uh, situations. So, mixed languages are different from any other possible uh, languages that you might have ever come across. Mixed languages are interesting because they are called dual source language, they are derived or sourced from two different languages almost in equal measure. So, uh, language 1 supplies the noun morphology, language 2 supplies the verb morphology and they, they come together and create one uh, different language, one different language, a new language. And this new language is not identifiable either with language 1 or language 2, that is what is a mixed language. Typically, the mixture is almost equal. So, as a result of which it because of the nature of the mixture these languages are cannot also be put under any of the language families because there is no language is dominant. When we say let us say a pigeon based uh, a creole becomes an acrolect it becomes a part of that language family. This does not happen with mixed languages a very interesting kind of uh, language uh, uh, entity. These are also connected to formation of a new ethnic identity typically these languages come out of coming together in intermarriage through intermarriage uh, between different uh, people belonging to different ethnic identities as a result of which uh, a new ethnic community also gets born. Let us see some examples of this. Uh, one of the most well known cases of mixed language is the case of Pitkins. Pitkins language has a very interesting history. Uh, one can read up on this about the mutiny on Bounty. Bounty was a ship by the, uh, the British Navy. So, they had so there was a mutiny and some of the soldiers escaped with certain uh, some Haitian uh, Haitian uh, men and women they and they went and hid in a remote island and from where they were not found for very long time. So, these people were uh, uh, living in an island this was a group of men and women from Haiti and the men and, and some British sailors. So, English language and their Haitian language and this gave, gave rise to um, a, a new language which was called Pitkins because they were living in Pitkin Island. This was one. Another is the mixed language created by uh, a mixture of French and Cree. Cree is, a, is an indigenous language. So, Canadian uh, fur traders and Amerindian women, the Cree women. So, fur traders went from one place to another. The Canadian French Canadian fur traders went further uh, north and uh, they met Cree women married them, took them along and kept on moving uh, away from the communities. So, as a result of which these people were not living either with the French or with the Cree communities. And over a period of time, uh, children started uh, growing, children grew up speaking a mixture of both of these languages. And um, as a result of which this new language, this new generation of people speaking the new language were quite far from their native place as well as in time. So, this is an interesting example of this particular language you can see. So, this is the, the middle part the she is holding it, this is the Cree part, this is this has the information about the subject as well as the object, this is quite almost complete in itself. However, this also has the uh, first part uh, la femme and then le petit. This, it has come from la petite. So, this is a modified version of the le petite. So, the woman is holding the child and you see that kind of a structure has been created using this. So, this is an example. Similarly, we have other examples also of this kind of mixture. So, this is uh, the copper island in the north uh, Pacific Ocean, basically Russian. Uh, this is a com between Aleut and Russian, com mixture of Russian and Aleut. Similarly, you have Quechua and Spanish. But this particular case uh, is also is not of um, you know marriage and then going out from the community. This is this was apparently this emerged when railroad construction was going on in the, the in the indigenous communities area. 
So, some people who were working and who were uh, with the railroad construction as well as other people involved, they created this uh, mixed language and they were using it among themselves. As a result of which they did not create a new ethnic group unlike the Russian and uh, Aleut or the French and the Cree communities. Another interesting uh, mixed language is that of Russianorsk. This is mixed between Russian and Norwegian. Uh, however, it, this also did not come out of uh, that kind of a scenario where marriages, uh, intermarriages happened. This was the uh, typical trade scenario and the people also were, were there was no dominant dominated scenario. Both the communities were equally powerful in terms of uh, wealth and technology. This was used by as a lingua franca by many communities of people. For example, the Sami, the Finnish, Samis are a group of uh, people in the northern Finland. So, the, the other Finnish speakers, Dutch and German, many people were using this. And then we also have the, the coming together of Chinese um, traders and Indonesian women giving rise to a separate ethnic group as well as a separate language which is called Chindo. So, these are some of the scenarios which are less common today. Today, it, they are less common and they are also slightly unusual outcomes of the different kinds of language and language speaking people coming together, language contact, different outcomes of language contact. Now, we go on to the our area of interest which is bilingualism and which is also one of the most visible and most common outcome of people coming into contact. Now, various kinds of language contact scenarios have given rise to bilingualism. Some of these are here. So, war, conquest and colonialism have given rise to a large scale bilingual scenario as we can see in India. Our colonizers have left 75 years ago, but right now I am speaking in their language. So, colonization has been very important instrument in creating bilingualism across the world. So, typically what happens in case of a war of any magnitude, the conqueror imposes their own language on the conquered people, on the weaker group. So, as a result of which over a period of time the conqueror's language becomes dominant language and overnight, almost overnight the local language becomes the weaker language. This then creates a scenario where for some period of time there will be always a time window within which people are typically bilingual or sometimes multilingual depending on the scenario. And over a period of time depending on many other social forces, uh, attitudes and so on there is also a chance of total shift from their people's own mother tongue to the conqueror's language that also happens. In any case bilingualism is often one of the common outcomes of this kind of a scenario war conquest colonialism and so on. And then immigration, immigration can be forced or it can be you know voluntary. Today you see a lot of people from India they go they go for greener pastures to the, uh, to the western hemisphere. So, that is that is a voluntary migration, sometimes there are forced migrations due to war and uh, various other things. So, what ultimately happens is one population moves into another. That has very interesting results as we will see when we discuss attitudes. So, it uh, often means moving into an already existing political, linguistic, social, psychological scenario. So, once now, the depending on the forces of acculturation, depending upon the forces of the attitude, social attitude, whether it is a positive, whether it is a negative attitude, it might give rise to bilingualism or it might want you to assimilate. So, many, many western countries have a, a very strong language policy in that uh, matter. So, the immigrants who are coming into the country must learn their own, the, the countries, the host countries language. So, that will, that is a process, that is a for, that is a um, acculturation force as we can call it by law which uh, gives rise to interesting results. So, there also we see bilingualism there might also be a total shift there may not be shift depending on many factors. So, now we see that language contact people coming into contact bringing languages into contact have many kinds of possibilities and so there are pigeons and creoles and mixed languages and there is bilingualism. But as I said things do not stop there things keep moving in a river water always moves in life people move languages move and change and so on. So, even the bilingualism also may or may not be a stable scenario in all situations. Sometimes the stability lasts longer sometimes the stability lasts much much shorter. So, what can happen what are the other possibilities one possibility is shift as I said depending on the perceived social 
pressure, perceived social status or the stigma you know depending on the language. So, what is the attitude of the larger community and also the speaker himself or herself that will decide whether the speakers will continue to speak their language creating a stable bilingualism or eventually they will make a shift. Typically what happens is if the native language is weaker, weaker in terms of economics, weaker in terms of job opportunities, weaker in terms of social prestige, gradually people would rather shift to the more powerful language. So, uh, when census data is taken, a lot of speakers of the local smaller languages do not identify themselves as speakers of those languages, rather they would identify themselves as speakers of the locally dominant language. So, let us say in uh, many, many Angika speakers may not say they are Angika speakers, they will simply say they are Hindi speakers or Bajika speakers in Bihar for example, there are chances that some people will not. So, this is what is called language shift. There is a disparity of social prestige and possibilities and opportunities vis-a-vis uh, -vis Hindi, hence people shift. Sometimes if you do not see any such threat, people will maintain their language. So, number plays a very important role here, the number of people who speak that language. So, even if you see a large number of let us say Tamil speakers also speak English, that does not mean Tamil speakers will stop speaking Tamil after a period of time because the number of Tamil speakers is huge, it is a very large community. And of course, there are many other factors, the, the, the perceived prestige, the heritage factor, Tamil language is considered, uh, considered one of the oldest and also it has a very long uh, history of art, culture, literature and so on. So, those factors also are important. But in any case, when there is a context scenario giving rise to bilingualism, language shift is among the possibilities. So, multilingualism given different kind of social prestige is one of the fundamental reasons for language shift. How do you know that the community is shifting from language one language to another L1 to L2 completely? There are markers. One important marker is when the code switching. Now, code switching typically happens, code switching means you are switching from one language to another. In a, in a, in a, in a conversation scenario, if I am speaking to somebody who shares my mother tongue, I could probably be talking in my own mother tongue, let us say I am talking in language X and then in the another third person appears into the conversation who does not speak my language and uh, both of us would shift to language Y now to include the other person. So, this is called a code switching dependent on the participant, dependent on the audience or participants in the, in the conversation scenario. This is quite common in any bilingual society. However, when you see code switching happens irrespective of the audience or the participant, but depending on context. So, we use some languages for certain purposes, another language for another purpose, when that starts happening, it is not dependent on the people, but it is dependent on context. That means, you are now comfortable in language Y more given certain context. This is how gradually code switching becomes a marker of gradual shift. And of course, the most important thing. Uh, for language maintenance or for shift or for bilingualism to exist, all of these are heavily dependent on the uh, background, background as in background attitude, attitude of both internal and external, internal as in how the community looks at itself, how the community understands itself and its position in the larger scheme of things that is internal attitude, external of course between the communities. So, sometimes this uh, power, status and economic opportunity all of these play a very important role, larger society plays an important role and the state also plays a very important role. In US, the English only movement is a very good uh, indicator of that. So, the larger social uh, views sometimes get reinforced through legal processes, legal ways. So, there are laws and bylaws and so on to impose one particular language that also happens and cultural inferiority of course, uh, that is one. The extreme case of uh, in this continuum, the final uh, possible stage which does not always happen, but it has happened in many cases is that of uh, language death. Typically when uh, you know there are this continuum and then shift gradually when you have shifted enough, the entire community has shifted from language 1 to language 2, then there is nobody uh, left to speak language 1. So, that is a case of language death. This is one possibility uh, and typically happens in uh, over several generations. Language death has happened uh, as a result of colonialism as well. So, entire communities, entire uh, groups of people have been wiped off in the Northern America. 
by the early colonizers. So, that is a, an abrupt change, abrupt uh, you know, uh, annihilation of the entire community and its language. Sometimes the death comes slowly like uh, through shift and so on, but there are also other cases of you know, catastrophic natural causes uh, but wiping out communities. This happens in case of smaller communities, uh, genocide and so on. So, language death is the ultimate uh, final uh, grim possibility for languages, but there is some ray of hope language can be revitalized as well. Language death happens as we see we just saw through various processes, but uh, if the atmosphere, if the political uh, will is there, if the society is ready, if the scholars are working on them, people are interested, language can be revived as well. So, language revitalization is also an interesting area of uh, research. Uh, typically, there are many, many ways of doing it. In America, what they do is now they have uh, total immersion schools, they are trying to preserve some of the Native American languages that are still around. So, preserving and uh, through teaching and using the language in different kind of scenarios. So, immersion programs are there that is happening and as a result of which the government should also have a language policy. So, in Indian case, uh, our language policy encourages use of all the smaller languages as well. So, apart from the scheduled languages, we have non-scheduled languages which are also encouraged. So, our language policy has a uh, role there, similarly many other countries. So, some of the languages uh, th that have been revived uh, throughout the world, most important example is that of Hebrew. Um, Hebrew is the classic language, it has been revived. Maori in New Zealand has also again been re revived. Maori's case is very interesting, if any of you are interested, you can always look at it. Maori community uh, suffered a lot due to colonization by the whites, the Europeans, but over a period of time the community uh, fought back, so much so that now uh, there are many of their cultural um, aspects have been adopted by the uh, others, by the whites as well. So, Maori language is a very good example of cultural and linguistic revival. Similarly, many Mexican languages have also been revived through this kind of processes. So, these are some of the basic ideas that I uh, wanted to uh, talk about in the first part. In the second part, that is in the next part, we will talk about in detail about the attitudes. Um, attitudes of the society, the forces of acculturation, government policies and how they shape and they shape and they also create or uh, destroy bilingualism, whether you allow bilingualism to be to prosper, whether you or you do not allow. So, depending on the situations, the reality changes. So, that is what we will discuss in the second part of this module. Thank you. Mm -hmm.